Welcome to our video on the introduction to viruses and viral replication. We know that viruses can make us sick. They are the common cause of ailments like the flu, the cold, chickenpox, measles, mumps. They cause diseases like herpes, mono, rabies, and viral hepatitis. They can cause more serious things like smallpox, polio, the bird flu, West Nile fever, yellow fever, and hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola. There's also evidence that viruses can switch on cancer-causing genes, and of course, we know that the HIV virus leads to AIDS. However, we have found that viruses are very useful in genetic research and genetic engineering. These relatively simple things are incredibly important to human survival. So what are viruses? Viruses are non-cellular infectious agents having two characteristics. They consist of a core of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, inside of a protective protein coat. Viruses cannot reproduce on their own. They can only reproduce when they infect a host cell. So the question is, are viruses living? I mean, we talk about killing viruses and fighting viruses off, but are they a living thing? Well, let's look at these two characteristics a little closer to answer that question. These viruses consist of a protein coat surrounding some nucleic acid. If we look at this picture down here, or these electron uh, microscopes uh, pictures of viruses, basically all a virus is is some nucleic acid core surrounded by some coat of protein. These are pretty amazing photographs here taken on these electron microscopes. You can see this is a flu virus over here, and I don't know what type of virus this is, but down here, here we have some diagrams. Here's a bacteriophage. This is a type of virus that infects bacteria. I think it's kind of cool looking like a space capsule or something. And over here we have an artist's rendition of the HIV virus, and you can see that the HIV virus is pretty complex. We have our nucleic acid core, our proteins are on the surface, and it's also incorporated by a lipid layer. But we have a big hint here. When we remind ourselves of the cell theory that we learned earlier in the year, we know that the cell is a small living unit and that all living things are composed of cells and cell products. Finally, all cells come from other cells. So, big hint, viruses are non-cellular, so first strike against viruses being living. When we look at the second characteristic of viruses, we see our second big strike cannot reproduce on their own. Well, in this case, two strikes is enough. And so for our specific definition of living things, the viruses are not considered living. So instead of saying viral reproduction, we're going to talk about viral replication. The first step is for a virus to recognize and attach to a host cell. And viruses are very specific to the host cell they target. For example, viruses that cause colds target the cells of the respiratory tract. However, HIV the human immunodeficiency virus attacks certain white blood cells. Now let's take a closer look at viral replication. We have two different viral replication cycles, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And we'll start with the lytic cycle. And so here we have a bacterial cell. We use a bacterial cell because it's kind of easier to see what's going on. And we need a bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria. And let's go through the steps. The virus attaches to the host cell then you see that it's going to insert the whole virus or just its nucleic acid into the cell. The viral DNA is going to take over the functioning of the host cell's machinery. It's um, injecting its genetic material and it's almost as if it's going to take this cell factory hostage and tell the cell, hey, instead of following your genetic instructions, you're going to follow these genetic instructions. So it's going to direct the cell to construct viral components. We see here viral DNA copies and viral proteins being produced. Once we've directed the cell to compose these viral components, the viral components are then assembled into the actual virus. Now let's think about why this makes us sick. We have a virus infecting a cell, and instead of the cell doing its job that it's designed to do, it's busy composing, uh, make building viruses. And eventually, the cell will lyse, lytic, I mean, to lyse means to burst. And the cell is going to burst and release these viruses to go on and infect other cells. So let's look at the whole cycle. We have a virus infecting a cell, taking over the cell factory, basically holding it hostage 
and uh, demanding that it create more of the viruses. The virus uh, components are created, then assembled, and eventually the cell bursts, releasing viruses to go effect, infect new cells. This is the lytic viral replication cycle. Now let's take a look at the lysogenic cycle. It starts off the same way. A virus infects a host cell. It's going to either put the whole virus in or possibly just the genetic material. In this case, we're just going to look at the genetic material going in. So there we've inserted the genetic material. And here's where things get different. This is the interesting thing. In the lysogenic cycle, the viral DNA doesn't take over the cell factory right away. It doesn't immediately start telling the cell to make viral components. It does something a little more devious. It's going to slip itself into the host cell's DNA. Watch this. It's going to hide right here inside the host cell's DNA, kind of like a hidden sleeper cell. And it's going to stay there, uh, kind of hidden, in what we call a latency stage. This latency stage, while the viral DNA is hiding out, um, the host cell can still be active and doing its job. And this DNA is waiting here, waiting for some signal to become active. In the meantime, the cells, like I said, going about its daily job, and when the cell divides, the first thing it does is it copies its DNA. And when it replicates its DNA, let's think about what it's going to do. It's also going to copy the host, or, or the viral DNA in this case. So if we continue to watch this cell divide, we call this process binary fission, if you remember. Uh, the cell is going to split into two, eventually. There we go. And that's called binary fission. Think about what's happened. This virus, this viral DNA, is now not in one bacteria cell, but in two. So we have the passive replication of the virus. And this is the hallmark of the lysogenic stage, or the lysogenic um, cycle of viral replication. Those two cells may divide into four, and those four could divide into eight. And so now we've spread the virus without the virus sh showing up or having an effect. So this virus has very sneakily infiltrated many cells rather than just the one. And it's used the cell's own um, reproductive cycle to spread the virus. Now at some point, this latency stage has to end. There will be some trigger that ends this and causes these, these viruses to enter the lytic cycle, which we saw before. So let's watch that happen. There's some outside signal, and the viral DNA will excise itself from the host DNA. So there we go. And then it will start to direct the cell to compose viral components. So we're building our virus parts. And after we do that, we're going to assemble those into vi new viruses. And after we have all those new viruses assembled, the host cell will, the host cells in this case plural, will lyse to release those viruses to infect more cells. Now during this process, something interesting can happen. Sometimes when the viruses leave these cells, they're slightly different than when they entered. And let's look at why that could happen. We need to go back to this part, where the viral DNA is hidden in the host cell's DNA. Sometimes when it excises itself, when it comes out, it takes with it a piece of the host of the bacterial DNA. You see it's picked up some of the white part here. And so this virus is slightly altered. So viruses can change that way. Uh, conversely, if we go back to here, sometimes the virus can leave part of its DNA behind. And so the virus that leave is slightly changed. So viruses can change uh, through this process of lysogeny or the lysogenic pathway. Also, if we think about it and go back over here, when we pick up this piece of bacterial DNA into the virus, when this virus eventually gets packaged, or this DNA gets packaged into a new virus and goes and infects another bacteria, it can take that viral DNA or that bacterial DNA with it and insert a new uh, bacterial DNA into the, the next bacteria that it, it infects. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about bacterial um, exchanges of genetic material. So let's recap the lysogenic cycle. Here's our um, bacteriophage infecting our bacterial cell. It's inserting itself into the host DNA. We have the passive DNA replication. So there's the lysogenic stage of viral replication in, in some of these viruses. Then we enter the lytic stage and we excise ourselves, build our viral components, assemble them, and finally uh, burst the cell to release those viruses. 
Now let's briefly talk about a couple types of viruses. Um, we mentioned bacteriophages, those viruses which infect bacteria. There's also lots of viruses that um, infect animals, and we named some of those before. Um, the rhinoviruses is a group of viruses that cause a common cold, and there are also many different, uh, quote, flu viruses. Uh, so you can see those. We'll talk about one or two of those a little bit more. There are also viruses that affect plant cells, but I don't have any of those named here. Um, but let's also talk about one category of viruses called retroviruses. These are what we call viruses that have RNA in their core instead of DNA, so that when they take over a cell, we have to have this backward step where the RNA gets reverse transcribed back to DNA and so then we can take over the cell so that's going to be interesting in, in just a moment um, retroviruses and then there are these things that are smaller than viruses prions and viroids they're almost like viruses that have lost parts or possibly they are the precursor to viruses prions are small infectious proteins and viroids are small particles of uh, usually RNA uh, that can cause infections like a, a virus without the protein coat. And we want to talk a little bit more specifically about HIV. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. Interesting to know that HIV is a retrovirus, it's an RNA core virus, and it's lysogenic. So it comes in as RNA, has to be converted to DNA, and then it hides out in the host cells. It can hide out for a very long period of time. Now, the reason why we spend a little extra time with HIV is obviously there's a worldwide HIV epidemic, and but the question is why is HIV so bad? Well, HIV by itself isn't bad. Uh, the HIV virus doesn't kill you, but HIV leads to AIDS. AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So we acquired this this uh, virus that is making your immune system deficient. And the reason why that is serious is because it leads to probable death. Well, why? Well, again, HIV doesn't kill you, and the condition, AIDS, um, while directly doesn't kill you, it leads to your death because the HIV viruses target specific white blood cells. We call these helper T cells. And the job of the helper T cells is to tell the other white blood cells to kind of become active, to fight off common uh, diseases. So when you have the HIV virus, uh, eventually it leads to AIDS because your white blood cell count or your helper T cell count is so low that you can't fight off things that are fairly common like pneumonia or the flu. And due to that weakened immune system, uh, you die. So how do we prevent viral infection? Well, it's, it's tempting to say antibiotics, but do antibiotics prevent viruses or kill viruses? And we have to remind ourselves that viruses are not living. Antibiotics are antibacterial. We don't use antibiotics for viral infections. The best way to prevent viral infection is through the use of vaccines, where we inject uh, a vaccine you know, typically early in your life to kind of um, stimulate your immune system to respond uh, more rapidly when you're later exposed to that viral infection. And the use of vaccines have nearly eradicated many deadly and debilitating viruses such as smallpox and polio. But as we understand how viruses and viral genetics works, we understand that viruses are constantly changing. And so developing vaccines for some things like the flu and the cold, which are rapidly changing viruses, has proven to be a little bit more difficult. So that does it for our introduction to viruses and viral replication. Make sure you review especially the differences between the lytic and lysogenic cycles uh, and know your, your steps for viruses or viral replication.